as you all know, we are uh, we are beaming all over the world. And uh, uh, thanks for joining in for this seminar series. As you all know, this is this is a CIB effort as well as a, a seminar from Purdue University. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Hustak. I'm professor of construction engineering and management and head of the division at Purdue University and uh, uh, also current president of CIB. So it is indeed my pleasure to be hosting uh, this seminar. And uh, as, as all of you are joining in from all over the world, I appreciate the time difference. And most of all, I appreciate Professor Amor joining in at uh, very early in the morning. It's about 5.30 for him in New Zealand. He comes from us uh, from uh, University of Auckland and uh, has, a, has a very interesting topic to present today, uh, building the future, how artificial intelligence is revolutionizing the construction industry. Uh, before we get started, let me give a brief background about Professor Amor. Uh, as I said, he, has, uh, he comes, from, comes to us from University of Auckland, has degrees in computer science and undertakes research in the field of construction informatics, with a passion for the application of beneficial computer science techniques to the architectural engineering construction and operations industries. He believes in achieving interoperability in his core research interest. And to achieve this, he investigates integrated environments, which covers information modeling, such as BIM, automated code compliance checking, process modeling, user interaction, information mapping, communication strategies, and so on. Since 2003, he has coordinated the working group of CIB W78, which is IT for construction. For the International Council for, those of you who don't know CIB, it stands for International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction. It's a global organization. Uh, he's also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Information Technology and Construction. So we stand to have a great treat in front of us. So please welcome Professor Amor. Robert, over to you. So kia ora and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to talk about uh, AI. Um, I'm very much building on the, the shoulders of giants as I do this work, uh, drawing upon the research which has been presented at CIBW78 uh, over the years and uh, also in the IT Con Journal, which is, uh, is a CIB supported journal. Our journey today, uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction to W78 for those who, who may not know it, uh, talk about why people have been excited about AI and what it might be able to do before going into the construction aspects of AI and, and what uh, we have seen the ability uh, of AI to impact in construction and have a brief discussion of some of the things which might be holding us back in construction, um, and then also what the impacts are likely to be uh, even further into the future. So brief introduction, uh, CIBW78, uh, as you say, is uh, looking at IT and construction, uh, is established in 1983, and we had our first conference in 1984. Uh, so uh, this is our 40th year of uh, international conferences uh, being held in Heraklion in Greece this year. Uh, please come and join us. You'll see lots of interesting papers around AI and construction. Uh, one of the things I've, I found interesting looking back at uh, our first conference back in 1984, uh, one of the papers there was actually on uh, AI. It was looking at uh, the Japanese uh, fifth generation computer systems and uh, how they were likely to impact on uh, the construction industry, the, the potential they had for the construction industry. Um, so this, this topic of AI has, has been core to W78 for, uh, for many, many years. Uh, in W78, we've, we've also, as well as presenting research conferences, have been interested in, in how we can use technology to help build uh, our community and, and the work we did. Uh, we did some very early work looking at how you could have an online repository of papers uh, at the time when everything was printed in, in big uh, proceedings that, that weighed three or four kilograms and, and 
people hated taking back in their suitcases. Um, so we had one of the very first uh, online repositories, uh, which is now very common, everyone has them. Um, we still have it running, the SciX repository, and, and all of the papers of W78 uh, over its 40 years uh, are available through that repository. Uh, the ITCON journal, uh, which is a CIB supported journal, uh, is an open access and online journal. So one of the very first online journals and uh, running in open access mode, uh, which was unique at that time. Um, and, and so again, that journal is still, uh, still going and uh, it's not unique anymore. But uh, at the time that we were investigating that, this was really novel. Um, the W78 community, we uh, have over 1,100 people who have joined the LinkedIn community. Uh, if people are interested in keeping up with W78, then uh, search for us on LinkedIn and uh, you can join up with us there. Um, as I said, I'm a computer scientist, uh, but I've been interested in architecture, engineering, construction uh, since my undergraduate days and uh, fascinated all the way through with the types of problems that there are in construction and, uh, and where computing could, could work. I founded a couple of companies, or co-founded a couple of companies, one looking at automated code checking uh, for New Zealand, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and uh, one looking at VR-based evacuation training, especially for, uh, for places where you can't uh, evacuate people in real life, like hospitals where, where it's not possible to move people out. And uh, when I get a bit of free time, uh, New Zealand's a beautiful country and I, I really love getting out into the outdoors, see the tramping or kayaking uh, to see bits of New Zealand. So talking about AI uh, and, and why we like artificial intelligence. Um, in the computing community, we, we used to say that artificial intelligence was just the things that we didn't know how to program yet. Um, and, and so as soon as we learned how to program them, they didn't become AI anymore. So uh, when we did optical character recognition, uh, initially that was AI. And, uh, and now I don't think anyone thinks of it as AI. We, we kind of know how to program that. So uh, it, it's uh, what is AI kind of evolves. Um, but a definition coming Wikipedia as uh, systems which perceive, synthesize, and infer information, uh, and they are machines which are doing that. I guess one of the things that uh, really excites people is we're seeing uh, AI able to achieve superhuman performance in many of the areas that it uh, is applied to. And I think that that is an area that should be exciting to us, uh, perhaps worrying to us, uh, that we are capable of, of developing systems or the systems are capable of learning to a level which uh, goes beyond what humans are able to do. Uh, so some examples of, of where AI uh, is, can be applied. Um, so the capability in, in skilled areas, so being able to recognize images of, of many different types, um, playing games of many different types. And a lot of people will probably rec recognize and remember when AI uh, beat the, the Go Grandmaster um, back in 2016, that was. Uh, it, uh, it was a, a feat that computer scientists had, had really not expected to be able to be achieved for at least another decade. We'd made very, very poor progress in, in doing this. And uh, back in 2016, the AlphaGo uh, beat the, the Grandmaster. The, the people who developed AlphaGo uh, said that at that stage, uh, they expected they could win eight to nine out of 10 games against the Grandmaster. Um, so they were fairly confident that they, they would win. Um, they kept on training and six months later, uh, a Grandmaster could probably only win one in a thousand games uh, against uh, AlphaGo. And they kept on training and six months later um, they determined that probably no human um, could beat the system they had and i think that, that was one of the uh, one of the interesting things that i hadn't really perceived about ai um, and, and it's obvious of course ai doesn't learn in the way that humans learn and and in many cases you'll see there's very slow progress uh, as ai systems learn a, a new task um, but they'll reach a, a 
human level of performance after some period of time, um, but the learning is typically exponential. And so they will then uh, become uh, very accomplished at the task they're doing and in many cases become superhuman in the task they're doing as, as they uh, go through. Uh, other types of systems uh, that AI is, is particularly good at um, is attentive systems. Uh, and, and this is a place where humans are, are typically weak. Having focused concentration for long periods of time is, is not something that, that we're very good at. Um, so monitoring, monitoring lots of video feeds, um, trading, you know, all, the, all the market trading is done by automated systems now, um, driving, uh, people lose focus and attention, but you know, AI systems, computer systems, don't get bored and, and their focus is always razor sharp on the things that they're doing. Um, knowledgeable systems, so AI systems can draw on, on more data than, than a human could read in their lifetime. Um, and high IQ systems, so again, ChatGPT and, and other systems that we're seeing now um, have basically read the internet. Uh, the, they're drawing on the total knowledge of mankind for the, uh, the results that they're giving back and the answers, even though they're statistical models, they're drawn up upon a, a very, very large base of knowledge to, uh, to provide those answers. So we see AI as, as being capable in, in many of these areas. And, and as you can probably see that these areas are areas which are useful in construction and impact in construction. So what I'd like to do is, is just get through um, a range of areas that uh, we have seen AI being applied to in, in uh, CIBW78 and, and kind of talk about uh, what we've been able to do there. An area I'm really interested in, but has also been an area of, of great attention um, since the 60s. Uh, the people have been looking at code compliance checking and the ability to take uh, the, the codes and standards that uh, we've written for our buildings, for our construction, and uh, be able to check a model against those uh, those buildings. Uh, we know that for humans, this is not a fast process. You know, typically, you need a, a large number of experts to be able to go through and do this. Uh, it can be error prone. Uh, again, people are, are not great at identifying everything systematically in, inside plans and applying uh, the rules or remembering all of the rules that need to be applied. So um, it, the experts can make mistakes in the, in the application of uh, their expertise to checking compliance. In many countries, and uh, New Zealand is, is no exception, uh, there are different interpretations of the codes and standards. And so depending on who looks at your building and which uh, uh, building authority looks at your building, you'll get different results uh, on those. And we know for many of our codes um, that a lot of the checks are really basic. Uh, I think almost every code has a, has a check that uh, the door of a room will swing outwards if the capacity of that room occupancy level is over a certain amount maybe 60 people in the US, I think it's 40 in the UK, 30 in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, you, you have a, a highly trained engineer who's, who's going through your plans, identifying rooms with a certain occupancy and checking if the door is swinging in the right direction. Uh, this, this is a, 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 a task that computers really should be doing. There's, there's no reason that we have humans uh, doing those sorts of checks. So there are many, many checks in, in our codes uh, where, where computers should be able to be doing this work. <laughs> um, tackling this, though, is, is a really hard problem and uh, it involves AI of, of many, many sorts. Uh, so starting with the written codes and standards, uh, so, so we use natural language processing uh, to look at uh, how what is being specified in those standards, understanding uh, what is written uh, for humans to interpret and trying to turn that into a, a code that, that computers can apply against a model. And uh, in the same way that humans have difficulty in interpreting codes and come up with different interpretations, uh, the computers have the same sorts of problems and, and we uh, have been doing a lot of work looking at, at how we resolve uh, the interpretation of what's specified in, inside the codes that we have. Um, uh, so this process is, is quite 
uh, complex. We have to interpret what is what is being written, uh, parsing the text which is there, uh, classifying the different clauses which are in the codes that, that we have, identifying the concepts. So, you know, what are the terms? What are the objects that we need to be concerned about? Uh, what are the uh, types of checks that we have? Are we finding an area? Are we finding a, a, a direction of swing? You know, what, what are those calculations that, that we need to be able to perform based on what's specified in the codes? Uh, generating code that the computer can use from that, uh, then starting to link it to the building model and, and finding the right information. Um, making those concepts align between what's specified in the codes and what we have available inside the BIM models. And then finally, um, doing the reasoning across that to be able to produce the reports uh, as our consenting authorities would um, to do that. Uh, many, many techniques are being uh, applied to this. And uh, in, in some countries, uh, where the codes are more prescriptive, they've been able to make um, very good progress in uh, having a fully automated code compliance checking and uh, uh, running out systems that can be used uh, in, in the whole country. Um, what we find is that many of the checks that we have to do are, are really very complicated to, to do the calculations for. Um, a number of codes around the world have, uh, have checks which are around um, uh, visibility. So, you know, is a toilet visible from a, a public area? And, and doing the checks which, which identify, you know, what is visible and what is not visible, determining what visibility actually means uh, is, is a really complex um, geometric problem. And, and we have many of these, uh, the, you know, determining the, the maximum height, uh, if you need to have railings or um, these sorts of things. So doing all of those calculations to determine exactly what that is, uh, is proves very difficult. And, and so identifying uh, how we do those calculations <clears throat> uh, has been a, a piece of work undertaken by many researchers and uh, say we're making progress, but we haven't found ways, especially for all of our performance based codes, we haven't found ways to solve all of the problems that, uh, that us are inside the codes, all of the calculations which are inside the codes. So a number of the systems which are out at the moment, you know, really look at a blend of human expertise and computer expertise. Uh, the computers do a lot of the basic checks um, and, and try and perform calculations uh, where they can infer what those calculations are, um, but aren't able to do all of the checks that, that you need inside a code. So a number of countries are, are working on uh, computerizing their codes uh, in an automated way or human support automated ways supporting humans. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, we've, we've computerized 15 of the, the codes, the acceptable solutions for the codes and, and have developed a system which is able to check a BIM model against those codes. Uh, but in many other countries um, that's happening as well. So Singapore is very advanced. They have a, a second cornet system. Uh, which is able to check a particular class of buildings against uh, the Singaporean building codes. In Korea, a lot of work has been done in that area, the KBIM um, initiative, which has uh, computerized their codes and is being able to, to do the checking on it. Same in France, a, a number of the Euro codes have been computerized. And so we're making, making progress there. And, and so soon we should be able to do a, a large percentage of our building codes uh, checked automatically um, through through the systems, being able to match uh, what is specified in the written codes to the BIM models which are coming out. Uh, it's still quite a long task uh, in New Zealand. There's something like 600 codes and standards uh, which are applicable to to buildings, and so we've uh, computerised 15 of them. Um, and you know, doing 600 is is a major piece of work, uh, and hence the interest in in using AI techniques to automate uh, that process and, and relieve the burden on, on humans having to do all of the translation that, that we have for that. Another area that uh, AI is being uh, applied to is enhancing the quality of the models, the BIM models that we have. So this process called semantic enrichment uh, has received a lot of attention over the years. And, and this is working from the um, the understanding that the humans are not 
great at uh, developing uh, high quality, fully specified models of the buildings. Um, and so in many of the processes where we need good information about our buildings, uh, when we investigate the BIMs that we get, we find that there are um, issues with those BIMs that they're often of very variable quality. Um, people may not have modeled the spaces inside the building or may, they haven't classified uh, the, the use type of, of a space. And, and many of our codes require knowledge about the use type to do the, the calculations that they're doing. Uh, people will model in, in very many different ways. So they might use slabs to generate a staircase uh, rather than using the, the staircase tool inside their, inside their BIM tool. Um, and, and so you get lots of slabs and uh, when when you interrogate the BIM model and ask, you know, what, what is the egress route from the second floor to the first floor, it will say, well, there is nothing because uh, there are no stair objects in, in the model. Uh, but the reality is that there are slabs there which represent a stair and, and so there is a, a way of getting out. So uh, what people have been looking at is, well, you know, can we use the, the computer systems to fix the models to improve the quality of our, our models. And, uh, and a number of techniques have been developed over, over the years which allow us um, to do this. So to be able to go through a model and uh, looking at the walls in the model, identify what's likely to be a space, uh, looking at thousands and thousands of plans and saying, well, you know, statistically, uh, the space here is likely to be of this type. You know, if it's a, a bedroom and there's a, a small room uh, which comes off it, it's uh, fairly likely to be an ensuite. Uh, and so statistically being able to uh, infer what the use type is, is going to be, uh, where a kitchen usually is in, in a building, where the toilets usually are in a building, uh, where the bedrooms usually are in a, in a building, um, and being able to classify automatically uh, what the types of, of uh, the the different spaces are. Um, that's also uh, been used to try and, and uh, fix models uh, where you know, identifying uh, slabs that could be a staircase uh, and so correctly classifying and grouping those things together to say, well, you know, this is a staircase object rather than lots of slabs. Uh, looking at models where uh, perhaps the modeling hasn't uh, accurately join the walls to the to the floor and extending the models so everything aligns perfectly and then you can do the calculations and simulations that you want to do because your your room is airtight or um, your structural systems are all connected in, in the right way so again where we have a, a base of of many high quality models um, have systems which are able to learn from those models learn what is the typical and correct way of, of putting a system together and uh, and from that inferring what could be applied to uh, someone's model which is not fully specified and improving that model to make sure that that it can uh, be used for for many of the calculations and simulations that we want to do uh, with our models uh, one of the things which is really important in the area is, is how we describe uh, the information uh, that we have about our buildings. So language defines what we can re represent and what we can reason about. And, and so finding the right language uh, to describe our, our models is, is a, a important piece of work for many of the projects that, that we have. And uh, the, what we need to do is identify the important concepts in an area. So again, AI uh, is, is often used, uh, you can, uh, provide a set of documents, maybe your, your codes and standards or documents which describe a, a particular area. Uh, and can I find the, um, mine those documents to find the terms which are important in that area and create ontologies which represent the information that you want for the area, um, automate that, that can, can be done automatically. Uh, where we have different ontologies to represent different areas, uh, again, we use AI techniques to, to find the equivalence between those. Um, so we want to be able to interoperate between uh, two different representations of a building. And again, automated techniques give us a way of matching the concepts that we have in, in different ontologies. And uh, the paper, the diagram at the top of, of the slide shows us 
uh, how how we might map or automate a way of, of mapping between information about building and information about regulation, the ontologies that we have for those. And, and again, uh, we can match those terms automatically and, and give us a way of interoperating between those. Um, and the concepts that we have uh, allow us to apply reasoning to the information that, that we have in our BIM models. Um, so the the diagram in the bottom uh, shows an example of, of how a, an ontology is, has been used um, to be able to do reasoning about uh, the patterns inside a building and uh, identifying what, what those different patterns uh, represent in, inside that building, but using the ontology to help drive uh, what we have there. So, so the languages that we have are, are important. And as I say, we, we have a number of techniques which allow us to extract uh, the, the right attributes about our building um, so we can capture that information and then reason about that information as, as we go. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we can do when we have this information is uh, answer questions uh, about uh, the building that, that we have. And what we'll have typically at handover of a building, we have reams of information uh, about the, the building, or about the manufactured products which are in that building, the, uh, the maintenance schedules that they have, the materials they're made out of. Uh, There's a huge uh, amount of information which is handed over uh, for the owner and the facility managers, and, and they need to be able to access that information to answer questions about uh, the, the entity that they are, they are managing on that. And again, uh, a number of AI techniques are, are now being applied in this area. Uh, you've probably seen lifelike avatars being uh, supplied by, by a number of companies which uh, which draw upon a, a very large base of information to answer questions that you have. And these sorts of avatars now can be applied to the, the information bases that we have uh, in the construction industry. So the information that's handed over and can be interrogated and, and provide answers to questions that, that people would have. Um, so you know, what is the area of a particular room uh, can be answered uh, by accessing these documents and doing calculations. Uh, what is the material type of a, of a particular door? Who manufactured a, a particular fire door? What's the maintenance schedule for that, for that particular fire door? All of that information can be identified and, and provided to a user um, based on, uh, on a number of search techniques that, that we might have available to us uh, from these areas. Uh, as I said at the start, AI is, uh, is very good at uh, vision problems, uh, identifying images and, uh, and learning from uh, those images. And that's an area that, that has been studied um, significantly in, in construction area. Uh, inspection tasks are, are needed for, for pretty much everything that, that we build in, in a, a constructed entity in our infrastructure and uh, you know, requires uh, experts to be wandering around your site and, and identifying uh, the quality of, of what has been built and, and whether there are um, uh, any snags, things that need to be fixed uh, in the building as it's been constructed. Uh, again, an area that, that computers and, and vision uh, approaches are, are able to support us with and, and automate in many cases. Uh, an important task because uh, the, the sign off is often linked to payment. So people want to be able to uh, identify that they've completed a task to, to the quality level that, that is required. And uh, as well as bringing people to site, you know, often these sites are remote. So you know, if you're inspecting a bridge, uh, then, then taking experts out to that bridge can be very time consuming. Uh, we don't need to have people traveling to be able to do the sorts uh, of identification. Uh, and uh, as we're seeing in New Zealand with uh, uh, the flooding and disasters that we're having here, um, being able to inspect uh, buildings in a disaster zone, uh, also very difficult to, to get experts to. So, so where we're able to apply these automated uh, detection approaches 
uh, to what's seen uh, in in photos and and from drones and and very other various other ways of capturing these imagery um, that that can be very very helpful to us now the two examples i've i've got here um, one of them showing uh, detection of air bubbles in concrete um, and uh, being able to classify uh, ones which uh, are going to be problematic and, and ones which aren't. Uh, it could be spalling in concrete, it could be cracks in concrete. Um, all of these sorts of defects can, can be identified with the vision approaches that, that uh, we're investigating. Uh, the image on the right uh, is, is looking at curvature of panels uh, which have been installed and again you know, something that we can determine to a very high degree of uh, accuracy uh, what the curvature is and, and whether any go beyond uh, the expectations that we have. Uh, as, as well as imagery or alongside the imagery um, we have many techniques for uh, capturing information about as-built buildings uh, and, and so typically we won't have a BIM model for, for existing buildings and we may want to have uh, accurate representation of those buildings so that we can maintain it. Uh, for the for buildings that we're constructing, uh, we may want to know uh, how much work has been done in a day, so what, what was constructed and again these techniques are, are very good at being able to identify uh, or capture uh, what exists at a particular time. Uh, LIDAR and photogrammetry techniques uh, can be applied very quickly uh, to a building. There are people selling you know, one hour uh, building scans uh, for, for residential buildings, so uh, very quick to, to capture imagery for it. Uh, the problem is that, that, that what you capture in these is, is a point cloud and uh, we, we as humans are very good at interpreting that point cloud and identifying uh, what, what is being represented by these millions of points which are, are visible to us. Uh, but for computers, this is much more difficult. And uh, we want to be able to have uh, models generated from these point clouds which represent uh, physical entities, the walls, the columns, the, the doors, and uh, all, all of these aspects. And so uh, a number of processes have been developed. Um, the image on the left is showing one process of going from point cloud at, at the very top through various ways of um, manipulating the points to try and identify surfaces, uh, identify what tops, types of classifying those surfaces until at the very bottom right there you get to a set of objects that could be represented in, in your BIM model. Uh, but accurately identifying uh, what an object is out of uh, out of millions of points uh, is, is a, a very tough problem that uh, AI is, is being applied to. Um, even where we have uh, good techniques for this, you know, we have occlusion in the, the point clouds that we have. Uh, we have uh, trees and vegetation which uh, don't let us see all of the objects. So we have furniture inside a room which uh, occludes parts of the, the walls that, that we might try to scan. Uh, people miss areas, um, glass and mirrors um, distort the, the laser points uh, which are, are picked up. Um, so taking these these point clouds which are not perfect uh, and trying to infer exactly what objects are visible uh, from those point clouds uh, a number of AI techniques are necessary to be able to to make that happen and make that work in a uh, in an accurate way uh, another area that, that people have been investigating is is looking at um, how we can do design uh, and whether we can automate um, the design process that we have. Uh, so a, a number of these techniques are, are looking at uh, generating large numbers of solutions uh, to match the criteria that you might have for a building or, or for a set of spaces or a floor in a building uh, and, and finding uh, across this, uh, these multiple criteria uh, ways which are uh, a design could meet those and, and so uh, you can generate millions and millions of, of different designs and, and assess those designs uh, to see how well they, they match uh, your requirements for it. Uh, AI techniques allow us to, to quite thoroughly search a design space, uh, so picking points across all of the potential designs uh, that you could have for the constraints 
that are specified for a building uh, and and in that way supporting an architect uh, designer uh, by providing uh, suggestions of, of ways that the design criteria could be met uh, you may have seen uh, some of the uh, the work that has been done around uh, art and, and generating art which uh, matches uh, particular artist styles uh, and again work has been done around that as well looking at architectural styles and being able to have a generator which will generate buildings which look like um, a Gaudi building or look like a Frank Lloyd Wright building uh, by mimicking the style of, of the architect that's there. Uh, so that's, um, again, uh, an interesting uh, approach, uh, but most of the work here has been used to look at alternates uh, in the design space that people have. Uh, a lot of work also looking at, uh, at scheduling and uh, how, how we might uh, learn what is a, a good schedule for uh, construction or design of, of a building, um, schedule for, for manufacturer, being able to send things to uh, prefabrication machinery, um, capturing the knowledge of, of our experts. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the people who are experienced in the industry are retiring and we like to capture the knowledge they have about um, how they would schedule um, and uh, construct a, a building. And so these knowledge based techniques uh, give us a, a way of capturing the knowledge of, of experts and then applying that knowledge uh, into a, a new design uh, to, to generate layouts or, or provide a, an accurate schedule that, that could be used for construction. So this uh, learning from past designs, again, if we have a large number of high quality designs, uh, we can learn what is, uh, what is being done in those designs and try and apply that uh, in our work uh, to see you know, what is a, a good layout uh, for, in this example here on the right, uh, piping inside a building. So generating the, the layout based on uh, knowledge of, of other layouts used in other buildings that have been consented. Uh, and the last area that I'll talk about uh, is around robotics. Um, so not necessarily the mechanics of robotics, uh, but uh, the AI is being used more in, in trying to make these robots autonomous on, on our sites. So uh, this is Spot the dog here, a uh, robot dog, is uh, very good at following a person around a site. So they have... Um, a good following behavior to, to follow a human around a site and, and do scanning um, as a human guides it around the site. Uh, but the, the AI interest is, is can we make this more autonomous? So uh, how can we have the robot planning its own route around a site to, uh, to look at particular areas of interest or particular parts of the construction that may have gone through in, in that day um, to do the scanning of that area uh, without having to have a human involved and in guiding it uh, around the, the site. Uh, same that the, uh, on the right top is a pipe robot. Um, so again, uh, being able to work out areas of interest in, in the pipe uh, and focusing its attention in, in these areas of interest uh, rather than high definition scans of every every centimeter of uh, a large pipe network. Um, and what we're seeing is, I guess one of the earlier areas is, is uh, having full driverless uh, capability in, in the machinery that we have on site. So doing site conditioning, uh, if we have very accurate models, then we're able to, um, do the site conditioning that we want, pile driving, um, those sorts of activities without needing to have uh, a human driver in, in the vehicles, so, so driverless construction machinery. Um, so I say uh, all, all areas that have been looked at uh, in W78 and ITCON over the years and uh, areas where we're seeing a quite significant impact uh, of AI techniques and, and our ability to um, detect and determine and, and create um, schedules for, for our construction and, and where they're slowly coming into the construction sites and into the tools that, that we're using in those sites. Um, I'd like to talk just very quickly about a couple of uh, barriers that, that we see in construction uh, to having these techniques work. Uh, one of these barriers is, is just around the data 
uh, that, that we have available to us to learn from. Um, so Google is really great at identifying what a cat is. And uh, th that's because Google has millions of photos of cats uh, available to it to, to learn from. Um, people put up their cat photos, they label them as cats. And, and so Google has, has this great resource um, to learn from. But we don't have the same for, uh, for the things that we're interested in. And you know, so where is the, the million photos of concrete cracks that we can learn from or concrete spalling or um, other defects that we might have in objects uh, that, that we want to be able to learn from or, or people who are wearing uh, personal protective gear. Um, so we need this resource of uh, not just images, but examples of high quality buildings uh, that, that our AI tools can learn from and be able to in, infer uh, what is the appropriate uh, way to go forward for, for these areas. Um, as well as having these images or, or exemplar data, they also have to be classified. So we need a ground truth on those. Um, so this image on the right, uh, you can see uh, there's this labeling there, labeling of a helmet, labeling of the high-vis vest, um, not labeling of the safety glasses, uh, although that should be able to be done. Uh, and, and so on, until we have a good classification inside our images and inside our examples uh, of, of, of ground truth, of, of what is a helmet, what is a high-vis vest, what is a safety glass, uh, then the learning um, is, is constrained in terms of what it's able to achieve. And so that, that getting these databases of, of information uh, is an area that uh, is, is slowing us down in, in many areas in, in construction area. Um, other barriers, uh, so people uh, will have their trust broken uh, if an AI system doesn't match uh, their expectation of, of how a system should work. And, uh, and rebuilding that trust uh, is quite difficult. Um, so before we launch a, a system, we have to be fairly clear that it is going to be able to uh, perform a, in, a, in a good way, uh, going to match the expectations of the users in terms of its performance. Otherwise, they, they'll lose faith in the system and, and don't, don't use the system. Uh, we, we still haven't really worked out uh, what is the legal status of an AI system. Um, you know, what, what does it own and what, what's its liability for decisions that it makes? Uh, we haven't really worked out what the IP implications are of many of these tools, or the, although people are already looking to sue Google and, and others about uh, the use of their material and, and what's generated by uh, by these AI tools, uh, because it is it's basing uh, its suggestions on work that other people have done, and uh, you know what what is the enforceability of the decisions which are made uh, from that. So, if you had a code compliance tool and uh, it says something is is compliant, uh, then what's its liability for um, for that work? And as we wrap up here, uh, I just talk about a couple of uh, thoughts about where we are going and, and what the outlook is. So I think as, as you can see from these AI systems, uh, we're able to do uh, reasoning at, uh, at a, a fairly large scale. Uh, we can look at a large bases of information and, and make assessments about what they are, apply codes to a, to a building and, and generate reports from them. Uh, these AI assist, uh, tools are, are not perfect, um, so they work well as assistants to humans, but um, certainly for the majority of them, uh, we, we wouldn't want them making all of the decisions that, that are there. Um, so the, this model of uh, an assistant to a human expert, I think is a, is a good model for us to be following in, in many cases. Um, and uh, you know we, we see that in, in medical areas and other areas where, where this, the systems are perhaps better at humans at determining you know, whether it's a cancerous mole or not, um, but you still have a, a human expert who does the final uh, look at it just to ensure that it is, uh, is performing in the way that you expect it will. 
um, handling speech, uh, these systems are, are now getting uh, very good at, at manipulating speech. So writing reports, uh, generating documentation uh, for our construction projects is an area where I think we're going to see great improvements in the quality of what's produced and how much is produced. Uh, and, and these AI systems will get us uh, into there. Uh, being able to ask questions and, and have answers coming back. So a, a conversational system, uh, which lets you interrogate information that we have about buildings uh, is, is something which is going to be with us in, in a very near future. Uh, for many countries where we have uh, international workforces and uh, translation of information is very important for the, uh, the foreign workers who are, are working on our projects and, and we're getting to the point where we can do this very quickly and, and to a level which is uh, beyond what most human translators are, are able to do. Um, our robotics are becoming uh, very, very capable and uh, flexible. And, and again, soon we're going to have more autonomy in those and be able to, uh, to scan sites and, and look for, for information on sites uh, in an aut autonomous way. Uh, the, inside their companies, uh, I think we're going to see uh, AI is going to take on many roles in, in the management of our companies. And, uh, and, and so that is going to change dramatically in, in the next few years and so not just construction specific, but uh, just the, the basic management of our companies is going to be driven by AI. And in many areas, we're going to see this superhuman performance uh, of AI systems capable of uh, outperforming uh, what, what humans are able to do. Uh, again, this, this is going to lead to some changes. Um, so uh, when we're able to, uh, to process uh, images uh, very well, then, then all of these inspection tasks, uh, the human need for uh, the need for humans in these inspection tasks is going to be dropping. And so we're going to see uh, jobs which are, are not going to be necessary in those. Uh, a number of the, the calculations that, that we have, if we're able to uh, perform many of, of the code compliance checks automatically, then the, the experts who are required to, to do that job at the moment uh, will focus on other aspects of, of the building. Uh, a fear here is, is that uh, this is going to be inequitable. Uh, so some countries will be able to do this better than other countries. And uh, the, so the, the access to this expertise is going to be focused in different areas and different uh, companies within a country uh, will be better able to access or this than, than other companies. And, and so the competition is going to change uh, within the market. Uh, so we're probably going to see um, a loss of a number of jobs inside the industry, uh, probably a loss of control over over our companies as AI systems run a lot of the companies that, that we have, take on a lot of the, the roles that we have, very much in the way that we see with trading, uh, that the trading is done automatically. People are really not involved in, in the trading that happens in you know, milliseconds and, and it's uh, just computerized and, and humans don't have a role in, in that aspect anymore. And I think we'll see that happen with a number of, of the functions that we have in, in our companies. Um, Longer term questions as well, you know, what what are what are we as humans and, and what do we do when when some of these roles are, are taken over by uh, by computers and by AI? And uh, that's a, a philosophical question that we can talk about at a later stage. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, open it up for any questions that people have. Thank you, Professor Amor. That was very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I would suggest that uh, even those of you who have a question, uh, please open your mic and, and uh, uh, raise your question, please. Very nice, thank you. Um, so one of the things that occurred to me near the end was uh, there seems to be opportunities to improve the productivity of uh, construction by uh, taking advantage of robotics and AI, is that uh, something that you see in the near future? Uh, yeah, I, you know, absolutely. So I, I think it's going to speed a number of the processes and it's going to improve uh, the quality uh, of the designs that we have and uh, of the information that we have and, and the ability to you know, move more to, a, I guess, a manufacturing 
um, type of industry rather than a construction industry where we can prefabricate and and um, and bring things on onto site to construct rather than uh, to you know to assemble rather than to construct on on a site. So yeah, you know, I, I, th I think many of these things are going to change uh, where the value is of of the work that we do and uh, improve uh, the the quality and the time, the health and safety uh, of our sites. Uh, which is is going to be better for all of the construction industry. Thanks, Professor Weidner. Uh, I think Hannah from Loughborough, uh, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry. Hi, sorry, it's not a question, but I'm undertaking my dissertation investigating the slow adoption of AI within the construction industry. So I've just sent my survey on the chat. If anyone's able to complete it, then that would provide some really good insight for my research. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, we can get else? an AI to answer it for you. Would that be useful? <laughs> <laughs> so while while people are thinking about the questions, you know, let me let me jump in and ask uh, some of the questions that are coming to my mind. You know, I've, I've always been thinking that so long as humans can cheat computer algorithms, uh, you know, there's much progress to be made. And I think it is, it is, it is a mutual growth that we, we are looking for more and more avenues of uh, using artificial intelligence in uh, many, doing many of the things that we, we want to do, particularly where extensive uh, data processing is, is necessary. So, but having said that, uh, you know, that also brings the question of, and you mentioned that earlier in your, in your talk that uh, computers can process information or AI can process information much faster than, than humans can. So do you see, uh, I mean, of course, self-evolving AI-based uh, applications and tools, but uh, where do you see a future in that uh, and, and the role of humans, of course? Yeah, so so that you know, what is our role? Um, that, that that is the interesting question. I mean, I, I, I my my take in, in the short term, as I say, I, I I think what the computers will be good at doing is the the simpler tasks, and I think that is going to be interesting for us because it will uh, free us up from the mundane that we do in, in, in our work and allow us to focus on, on the interesting, the, you know, the, the wicked problems that we have in, in construction and, and the design of, of our buildings uh, to, to be able to focus on um, you know, many more interesting alternates uh, to our designs and explore the, the design space that, that we have uh, in, in greater detail than, than we hope could with the constraints that we have now, and, and that would be supported by AI systems, which can uh, do a lot of the calculations, simulations, suggestions, uh, which you would have to do as a, as a, as a designer yourself uh, at the moment. So, you know, in, in the short term, I, I think it, it gets really interesting because we can focus on, on my, you know, much more interesting aspects of, of our jobs. Um, and a, a lot of these calculations that we do and simulations that we do, you know, I, I think will become the preserve of, of computers. And uh, I, I think that's going to change what we teach uh, in the universities in terms of, of you know, what's necessary for, uh, for our professionals to, to understand and what's going to be taken over by, uh, by computer systems and you know, where, where we add value in, into this process. Uh, in the longer term, you know, the, it, it seems inevitable that these systems will be able to perform uh, majority of the tasks that a, that a human designer can do or a, or a engineer can do and and so we will see systems which are able to uh, to to create the designs to the level that, that a human expert would uh, and without the need for the human expert and uh, at that stage it's uh, you know it's kind of interesting uh, what what we do at, at that point uh, Lee Sedol, who, who was the Go Grandmaster, um, uh, said after he was beaten by the AI that he wouldn't play championship Go again because he always knew that there'll be something that could beat him even if he beat every other human. Um, you know, and, and you know, so, so, you know, do, do we do we put aside uh, 
you know, what what we our professions are and uh, and let the the computers do it um, in other areas. So you see in the chess world, you know, human chess competitions are still a really big thing, even though computers will beat any chess grandmaster. Um, you know, so so I think you know it's, it's kind of our choice. Uh, you know that that we can still work in these areas and we can still get satisfaction and we can still um, design and create things in these areas, uh, even though there may be AI systems which can do very similar jobs to us. That is a, yeah, that is indeed interesting. Uh, we have a couple of questions that I see in the text in the chat coming up. Uh, Martin, go ahead. You have a, your hand. Well, th thank you very much. I, I suppose it was a, a very similar, uh, it's a follow-on question uh, to your, yours, Mark. Um, the weak link is often the interface between the, the, the uh, automation and the human. And uh, I guess as robotics uh, come into the, um, the, the realm, that interface pushes further and further out in the construction process. But ultimately, I guess humans are going to be involved at some stage, get your comments around that, it, making that interface work um, effectively. Yeah, it, and again, that's a really big area of interest, uh, perhaps more so in computer science than uh, other areas, uh, the robot robot human interaction uh, and you know, as, as well as human computer interaction areas, um, finding good models for, for how we collaborate and interact uh, with machines is uh, is still a major area of, of research and I, I don't think we have perfect examples there. I, I think what we're seeing with avatars and the capability of avatars gives us an idea of, of where that's going to end. Um, you know, that, that uh, the, the, being able to create a very realistic um, representations of a machine uh, to for us to interact with uh, is, is now very much uh, possible, and uh, you know we seem to have got past this uncanny valley effect where where these avatars are now uh, so natural in their representation and their expression and, and their speech uh, that people see them very much the same as as a real human and so i think we are we're finding ways of of bridging that um it's, it's not all solved and and certainly with robots that that's a different sort of interaction uh, but again i think that will come in the next five or ten years yeah thank you thank you for that question martin uh yashu you had a question We might have missed him. Uh, Nicola, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, sir. I just like I was on mute. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Yashu. Nicola, please. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. So, sir, actually, my uh, question is like, uh, how does an AI could be used to improve the performance of existing structures? Like, we already have like majority of the existing structure which has already been done, and how could this technology help us to reduce the cost in the future? And secondly, how could we justify to the owner saying that? It's a long-term sustainable commitment to the society and it can be used to optimize the cost over a long term. Because initially implementing it would be an added cost to the owner, but for a long term, how it can be justified for this thing? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you answered the question yourself, didn't you? Uh, that you know that that long-term sustainability is is the uh, I think the key to it that we're able to uh, identify. You know how how we're going to be able to have better performance for the lifetime of of the asset. Uh, that we are doing predictive maintenance rather than scheduled maintenance on on it. You know based on uh, how well the structure is performing. It's which is you know what we can determine from uh, IoT or sensor networks which are, are monitoring the structure or, or you know, vision approaches which are, are looking at the structure periodically to determine the deterioration of of different aspects. Uh, so, so I think we can be a lot more clever about how we deal with our existing structures, um, even if we don't have uh, you know, full BIM models or, or other uh, models of, of that structure, we can apply a number of these techniques to, to look at what is there, what is the extent, and plan around that information. Yeah, thanks, Yashu, for that question. Uh, Nicola, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, Robert. Thanks a lot for the great presentation. Very comprehensive. and. Uh, 
I, I find I find really interesting. I mean, also from a, let's say uh, you know uh, next next uh, development and uh, something that gives you something to think about is that you also listed what are the possible drawbacks of the use of AI in the construction sector, right? So when you say that, for instance, jobs would be uh, some jobs will be at risk. Uh, so we're going to have some parts of the organization automated and so on. So this brings, of course, disruptions in the sector, both in a positive and a negative sense. Do you, do you think that AI is what we need in the construction sector to um, break that mechanism of uh, inertia, of uh, uh, slow, in, slow pace innovation, which is in general affecting the sector since many years? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it, that's the bit that scares me the most because it feels to me that a construction sector is ripe for an outside organization, you know, non-construction organization to come in and, and apply a number of these techniques and establish a fairly dominant position in it. You know, so you know, why can't a, you know, a Google subsidiary uh, or a Microsoft subsidiary uh, come in and decide that they want to take on construction and and use their knowledge of, of AI techniques and their ability with the information bases they have to become a, a, a dominant player in the construction industry and, and really change the way that, that construction works. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think uh, construction industry firms should should be looking you know, much more at the potential of of some of these AI techniques and the work that they're doing, and and my worry is if, if they don't, then you know then they may well be pushed out by outside players that come in and and uh, displace them in, in the industry. Yeah, brilliant. Thank Thanks, you, Nicola. Uh, anybody else that I missed? Uh, I know there were some hands raised, but I might have missed somebody. Anybody? So, uh, Ania, yes, uh, please. Shall I go next? Uh, hi, thank you so much for the great presentation, Professor Amor. I really uh, enjoyed all the details and all the viewpoints you shared. Um, I have like more, um, maybe share my own viewpoint here, and I would like to know your opinion on uh, that. Uh, what we see is that both in the research sector and also in the industry, um, there are, there are like two different approaches. Some are very resistant toward change and including AI in their practices. And some are overwhelmed by uh, all the possible advantages it could bring to the table. Uh, and sometimes we see like very simple problems that do not really need the inclusion of AI are being following that, are following that path just for the sake of following the trend um, or whatever. Uh, what? How do you think we should set a limit or a kind of guideline of using AI for different problems? Because uh, it's not only the engineering or design problems, we have also project management issues that could be addressed using AI. We have legal issues that could uh, be addressed through using AI. Um, but I think our sector, unfortunately, is not as uh, well-trained as other sectors, uh, in, including of AI, what do you think is the most um, effective and most useful way of setting these boundaries and training the practitioners and uh, academicians in our uh, sectors uh, of AI inclusion in their research and practice? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, uh, so, so I think it has to happen at lots of areas and lots of levels. Uh, you know, the training for new professionals, I, I think, has to change uh, in, in terms of uh, what they are going to see as their role and, and where their skills are going to be applied or what skills they, they need to apply. And so an understanding of, uh, of these techniques and where they're going to be applicable in, in their profession, I think, is, is needed in, in the people that we are training for the industry now. I guess a lot of these things will happen by stealth. Um, so AI will appear in the tools that we're using and we may not recognize that, that it is AI, uh, but we will just see it as you know, a general improvement. Our BIM tools will be able to do um, much more sophistic sophisticated calculations. Uh, they, they will improve the quality of our models automatically uh, through semantic enrichment techniques. Um, and we won't know 
you know that we won't may not even be told that there are AI techniques being used to to do that. So I, so I think some of it all you know, will just come through in, in general improvements in the in the tools, um, and people may not feel that they're buying into uh, apply, applying AI to to achieve that. Uh, which you know, in my mind, is a slower way of doing it. You know, I, I I think people should be perhaps more aggressive uh, in in their use of of techniques that we want to accelerate um, the uptake of of these techniques uh, rather than wait for them to uh, to trickle down and in, into the tools that we have. Uh, that, you know, we can get benefit now. You know, why aren't we getting the benefit? that we could now, why aren't we improving the safety on our construction sites when we have these techniques that would allow us to do that now? Uh, it feels many of these things, sh you know, we should be more proactive and in, in, uh, looking to the value of these techniques and applying that uh, where we see the value accruing to our projects. Thank you, Anya. Uh, well, in the interest of time, I know there are, we can continue this conversation as it, as it then topic is just very interesting. But let me take the privilege of asking the final question, if I may, and uh, bringing it back to uh, you know, our uh, academic concerns. We already see that as soon as chat GPT was out, you know, many universities have put out a cautionary note of what would be ethical submissions and what would not be ethical submissions. And uh, so that you know, immediately brings back memories about the early Wikipedia days when those references were just not accepted, but now certainly we have a protocol of how to put a web mm -hmm. reference and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I think you might have already started answering this, this question, but um, the question I'm trying to raise is that, you know, there's certain base skills that we, we, we have valued so far, which might soon get replaced by uh, AI applications so uh, I think picking up on Anya's point here, you know, where do we draw the line, or is there a line necessary? Are we are we to think that there should not be a line, or there should be? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, so I mean, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, these tools exist, and we we can't you know we can't turn our face away from them and say, well, they don't exist or, you know, we shouldn't use them. Uh, you know, the, I think the analogy that, that people make to calculators is, is very apt here. You know, the, the calculators changed uh, what we did, what we taught and, and how we approach problems at, at the university. Um, and, you know, chat GPT and these tools are, are a, you know, a technology like calculators is going to change our industry and change what we do, change where the value is in, in uh, what we do as professionals and, and what we need to teach. Um, but, you know, I, I think it will be uh, remiss of, of the training institutions to say, you know, we're going to ignore these technologies because the industry is going to be using them. You know, the, the companies will be using chat GPT to, to write documentation to write their submissions to uh, the consenting authorities, you know, because the, they'll be very good at writing uh, in a style which is needed to, you know, to put your submission through to a council uh, or, you know, much of the documentation that, that we have. Um, so industry is going to be using these tools. And, and I think we put ourselves in a poor position if we don't teach our students uh, about the technologies and tools which the industry will already be using. Yeah, indeed, indeed, and and there are many more questions that you know these kind of discussions raise as well, as in uh, what skill sets we let go and what we don't. Uh, but having, I'm going to leave it at that, so everybody is is uh, is thinking about it. Uh, but in the interest of time, please give Professor Amor a big round of applause. I I, I uh, implore you to open your mics and and uh, give him a physical round of applause. Round of applause. You could. You could. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Robert, you taking time early in the morning to, to give this very interesting uh, seminar to everybody around the world. So with that said, thank you again. Thank you everybody for joining in and please look forward to the next seminar next Friday. Uh, look forward to seeing you all. Thanks, Robert. Bye.